Ladies and gentlemen, we Connor up. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we colonise the moon. Complex talk on the recolonize the moon. Um, we prepared tonight because, it's, as you can see, many people think recolonize the moon is a project. But if you take a look on our business color, it's, it's not a project. It's uh, actually us working together as a corporation named Recolonize the Moon. And the whole thing is so complicated. So we try to give a lot of background story, uh, a lot of history of the work. And for this, we prepared a very complex work. It's the second time that we speak together, actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I already apologized that you have to struggle with my. Uh, it's, I think it's quite easy to tell that I'm not from the UK. He's Fabian. Uh, a lovely area, a lot of technology, a lot of science. Uh, Schwabian is kind of like the Scotland of Germany. It's lovely people, but penny people. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Tonight, what we try to present is we have this very worked out roadmap. There are just two possibilities A, it works, B, it fails. <laughs> it's, it's a complete news, what we call it, we call it a structured talk, what we do tonight. It's a roadmap with a one way ticket. Yes. And, and the first thing is that the talk is structured in three parts A, B, and C. We are here now, at, uh, here it says, Hagen, start talking. This is what I did. <laughs> um, and I'm done with the first post it saying we prepared for this very complex talk, structure talk, and then uh, you should actually start talking. No, no, hang on, I, I showed the first film. Why did we show the first film? I would like to introduce the first section of video. This is um, going to be familiar to some people, it's a bit ageist, this first clip, because some of you are going to recognize it and some of you are not. I will see. Oh, we forgot that one. This is uh, just a picture of that one, just in big. Isn't it beautiful? Well, <laughs> of all the planets in the solar system, of all the stars in the Milky Way, perhaps the most troublesome is this one. This cloud covered planet called Earth. <coughs> Our planet, the home of the human race. People have stood on the earth and looked away into the sky and tried to imagine what life would be like on other planets, other stars. And they have done more than imagine. They have invented things. Complex rockets so powerful that they will blast away from the earth and carry space probes to invade these distant planets. Robot devices that will land, explore, take photographs, and even dig up pieces of the unfortunate planet and make off with them. <laughs> Who can say what havoc may be caused? What peaceful lives disrupted by these unwarranted intrusions? Good to stop here. Oh. No. <laughs> Anybody? People remember the clients? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Agnes, do you know the clients? Yeah. Do you know the clients in Germany? Yeah. I had, I had uh, same. I had no clue about the planners. I knew all about the mouse and all the other stuff we had, but the planners were <laughs> totally new. But 
Okay, well, for the benefits of anyone young enough not to know the planning or anyone from Germany, um, <laughs> 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 um, the Klangers uh, was first shown in 1969, the year after people came to New Landing. And they're the invention of a couple of very classical British inventors um, and later animators, Peter Furman and Oliver Postgate. Um, and some of you will also know Oliver Postgate as the um, character behind Bagpuss. And just a little anecdote, Bagpuss's Emily um, grew up in the same village as my friend Joel, who features later on in the talk. Um, Okay, I'm obviously going on piste, so, um, okay, lovely quote um, from a NASA scientist in 1969 who commented, the clangers, an attempt to bring a note of realism to the fantasy of the space race. <laughs> okay, so uh, back from the clangers to, to uh, how it actually came that we both work together, so this is very... Uh, we come to this later as well, I think, so I'm going to stretch it for you to get all the background information. It all started actually like two years ago, so before we go and start it all two years ago, in, uh, in a very like remote place in Norway. Have a look. Have a look, yeah. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I, I did some research in Norway with my small institution, so I, I've been there in residency, and it... it absolutely started on the 10th of September 2008 at 10 o'clock 28 when I was riding my bike for two and a half hours parallel to the first beam of the large headphone collider in a circular shape above, <laughs> above four fields representing the four big experiments of the large headphone collider stone in the middle as orientation oil on canvas, huge mass uh, just to see how the particles spread some stuff I had already uh, thought of that this would happen, but some things were really surprising in this experiment. Um, luckily, I remember on that day that uh, the, the director of the place asked me to pick up around like 12 o'clock. Luckily, I was just finished with my piece. And an artist called Sue Cork at the bus stop. So I took the car, drove down, and uh, this is where we first met. This is not a bus stop, but Sue. <laughs> Okay. I'm just coming back from uh, helping the International Art Project where I'm oh, oh, goodness. I think the climbers are in town. Um, I, I, I was just coming back from helping the International Art Project where um, I've been making a project called the Artist Shooting Club, which basically um, I could give you a long, lovely cultural theory lecture on what we were doing there, but basically we were shooting up the text of Walter Benjamin and others, um, <laughs> taking rather literally his insistence that ballistics and travel and the authenticity of the art objects were kind of the major area of discussion. And we went to a place called Helsinki Shooting Club to do this. And actually what really lay behind this project was that otherwise unintended ambition of a group of very otherwise <laughs> passive uh, liberal artists to really get their hands on some serious weaponry. So we shot Magnums and Rugers and had a bloody good time. Yeah. And this is me just looking a little psycho. And, uh, <laughs> and then on two night trains to get across to Norway. And so this is the state I'm in roughly when Harvey picks me up at the bus stop. So this is how we met, actually. This is how it all started. Oh, sorry. Sorry? Uh, this is how it all started. So, um, after the scary experience picking her up, uh, the bus stop, kind of like a David Lynch moment, uh, we both disappeared again in our luxury, gigantic studios in this fjord. And, uh, you. <laughs> okay, so um, actually, this is uh, kind of where I have to confess that Previous to working with Hagen, my work was actually quite small. I'm by trade an illustrator and printmaker, so I'm used to kind of sharing a studio with eight other people and bending over my work and making it very tiny and trying not to get in anybody's way. And I got to Norway and they said to me, this is your studio, and I said, what do you mean this is my studio? I thought there were about 10 people going to be sharing the studio with me, and they said, no, this is yours. 
Um, and I'd also been traveling now around Europe for several months doing residency for projects. I'd managed to lose most of my possessions. So I had really nothing left to draw on. Um, and then I found this huge ream of newsprint somewhere. So kind of I exploded into the room and began doing very, very large drawings of the forest outside, which was reflecting beautifully in the studio at night. But what was really exciting was that I discovered an overhead projector in the corner of the room. And because I'd run out of drawing paper again, started to make drawings with pinholes in little bits of cards with the idea of making some starship, uh, starship, Ooh, that's a nice idea, um, star map animations. So these are my lovely deer gambling through the forest, and the project is called No Name Forest. And then Hagen rather unceremoniously at the end of the project decided to burn my drawing. Uh, I took care of it later. But, um, so these are the neighbors. This is my studio. This is where I am with my uh, research going on, building instruments, uh, setting up reading area, and so on. So the research I'm doing, what I do as an artist, talk about this later. Um, basically, I, I, in Norway, I worked with my instruments on the idea of landscape and how landscape is constructed. And I worked with laser beams, different instruments, mesh and instruments. And I was interested in like the 3D models, like early 3D models of like CAD models and AutoCAD models and all that stuff. I mean, you remember all that when you see just this picture, which was maybe the first picture that is known from like this construction time. And uh, I had in mind to do a huge scale installation where I turn landscape with a massive laser grid back into like a model state. I was the idea at least at this time. Um, usually uh, I couldn't get funding for 10 powerful lasers, but uh, what we had at this time was a car. <laughs> so this was basically our uh, research instrument and after we be neighbors and talking about our uh, landscape, construction of landscape. Uh, I don't want to be stereotypical about it, but I'd like to point out that Hagen, coming from Stuttgart, the home of Porsche and Mercedes, and high technology design, was interested in AutoCAD and lasers, and I'm interested in poking holes in bits of cardboard coming from the north of the UK. But anyway, we, 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 we haven't fallen out yet at this point, so um, we embarked on what was advertised to us as um, a short... Sunday Norwegian walk. Yeah, the re recommended Norwegian Sunday trip. So he goes like, ask uh, this Norwegian guy. I think thing. Olaf advertised it as max seven hours. Yeah, he said it's, like, oh, it's really easy. You take the car, you drive up the fjords two hours, then you park the car, you walk up the mountain. It's really nice. You ask the people on top there running a small cafe place. They show you how to get over the glacier so you don't die. <laughs> We've had no mountaineering equipment whatsoever. <laughs> well, this is how it all started. So our research equipment was the car, so we started driving, as Olaf described it, as a recommended Norwegian Sunday trip on kind of like still urban environment. Try to do roads to look like more like 3D renderings. Just all a bit too beautiful. And then the landscape got like more and more like, somebody did a too good job in Photoshop. <laughs> a bit too much blue here, a bit too much too much mountains, too much texture in the 3D models. Like when you say to your intern, it's like, ah, oh, it's nice, but it's a bit over there. <laughs> <laughs> and um, slightly, I think it slightly got crazy in this landscape by, by, because it became more and more beautiful and more and more pure and like nothing. That's it. Our jaws were kind of sort of getting a bit slack. We started off quite animated, and by the time we got there, we were pretty much dribbling on the floor. <laughs> Especially if you know Lancaster, Preston, Bradford, and Leeds, you'll understand what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this is what we saw for like two days, and then like at one point, bang! There was this electric electricity pylon in the landscape, and we both had this feeling like it's like, where the hell is the pylon coming from? What is it doing here? It's like where's the structure coming from? It, it really was kind of one minute pristine landscape and you had this feeling that if you span around really quickly you might just catch the IKEA engineers putting the last pebble in place. Um, and then suddenly there were these huge metal constructions from mankind striding across the landscape. And I don't know, we, we argue about this a bit, whether Hagen said it or I said it, but one of us turned to the other and, and said really pretty much, oh my god, it really looks like we colonised the moon. The strain through the landscape of rock and ice, and then these huge metal scaffoldings crossing it. <clears throat> okay, um, 
on our map, I think we're here, it's called it's the pylon bang. Um, right? Uh, okay, what we want to do at this point is, is something we never did in the talk, we want to do a meanwhile cut, something we learned from the movies. We really ask you to remember like this last picture of pylon and we want to skip back in time and explain what happened before we came to this pylon, which is kind of a key element in our work. Uh, Sue, I think is used up. Yeah, in, in case you're curious as to quite why a Norwegian Sunday walk should turn into a project about the moon, perhaps it's helpful to understand a little bit about our backgrounds. But this is my family, okay? Or well, at least half my family. This is my uh, English grandmother, the mathematician, oh. looking kind of very English eccentric. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Granny. <laughs> Her husband um, was an engineer, so I want you to get this uh, feeling immediately already of uh, middle class people with high aspirations for their grandchildren. Um, and this is my mum, who's coming from the Welsh speaking area of Wales, the Lida. And uh, in the time that she was growing up, Welsh speaking Wales is dry on Sundays, and everybody goes to chapel, and it's a big farming community, very traditional, very uh, Baptist Methodist. and. Um, She's hoping very much, along with um, everybody else, that I turn into some kind of intellectual. Uh, she marries my father. They both do degrees in chemistry, and they meet at Courtauld's Laboratories in Coventry. And this is my dad trying to work out the square root of Pythagoras in order to turn his canoe around. <laughs> um, looking like a cross between Peter Snow and Tony Benn, I think. Anyhow, this is my family, and um, I let them down. I'm sorry, Dad. <laughs> So we would jump to my family, it's my parents, it's my mom and my dad in the 70s, and it's my mom and my dad in the 70s. My mom is kind of like reading us in a manual for something, my dad just has to mind how, how big this tree gets one day. Um, I have like two older sisters, one older brother, I'm the youngest. Um, as a kid, uh, I had in mind maybe to do something later on, if there really maybe was like, this is the family pet. <laughs> become like a scientist. I was really deeply impressed. I didn't want to get an astronaut when I was a kid, but I was really impressed by Chef Coustan, like the French diver. Because actually, he was an astronaut underwater. It was like the most incredible equipment. It was just too good. And um, using like all these tools, I was clear. So, uh, one day I have to do this. And of course, he was like a really cool guy. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, just to see a bit more, it's like it's a bit embarrassing to show like his pictures as a low presentation. Like, it's me, it's like I'm seven, it's my, it's my brother, it's a friend of my brother who's a, a physicist, and my brother in law is a computer scientist. And, and my, my childhood was surrounded by like incredible tools like a remote controlled helicopter. Unfortunately, like it reminded me when, when your rocket crashed, Agnes, is that the helicopter of my brother crashed after five minutes flying, which was a very dramatic moment for me. That's a workshop of my dad. Very German, as you can see, it's like all lined up. <laughs> <laughs> we came kind of like genetically to my work later. Um, it's me as a kid doing early science experiments, like solar balloon, aviation, and so on. And this came every week by a very dangerous magazine called Oops, maybe the one or the other knows. I think Sasha or the Germans will know this magazine. <laughs> This is kind of like the clangers for us. So it came every week, it's like this little scientific experiment. And I think everybody who, who was really oops is today A, crazy, or B, an artist. So this is what I did. C, a nuclear scientist. Oh, a nuclear scientist. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, whilst Hans is being uh, very German in Germany, I'm being very English in England, and concentrating on watching Blue Peter, Tomorrow's World, and making mud pies. And back to the clangers. Um, the clangers were by far and away my favourite childhood animation and um, really kind of influenced my future. I was during this time starting to draw, make models, and really already at the age of about four and a half disappointed my parents terribly. Um, but anyway, I, I remember the clangers and through conversations with Hagen, I said, you've got to, you've got to take a look at um, one of the postgates drawings of the clangers. Um, and how we're going to get the clangers landed on the moon, because I've seen some of Hagen's graphical works, drawings of um, little tests and experiments he wanted to do, and I saw immediately the connection. So, 
while, while I still was watching the clangers, I was reading books and I uh, got all these fantasies. And at that time, I, I got more and more interested in like space science and astronomy. And this is my first telescope I had. Um, but on, on a visit with my mom to the local planetarium, I met this guy in, in a magazine. There's two things. One thing is the guy reminded me instantly on Leonard Nimoy. I thought it's like, wow. But it's not Leonard Nimoy, it's the instrument. I was kind of catched by the instrument. So I said, if I want to become a serious scientist one day, I need that telescope. There is nothing. I said, this is, if Leonard Nimoy uses that telescope, if I want to become an astronomer and astronaut, I need that telescope. So uh, I calculated my pocket money, how, how long I have to collect my money, and I came to, I think, 275 years or something before I could afford a telescope, so this was just not possible. Then I think my, my art teacher told me, say, say, oh, no, he said, he said, oh, maybe you should try to participate in, from, like, in, in the painting contest from the local saving banks. They have like a first prize, it's like 50 euros every time when you win. So I started like painting, kind of like a couple of prizes, but even that was not enough. Then a friend told me, at this time I was a serious kind of like junior scientist and, and pure atheist, to say like religious was something for me completely out of questions, I couldn't believe all the stories, and I denied to go to the first Holy Communion. But then a friend told me that his older brother went to Holy Communion the first time and he got enough money to buy a small motorbike. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I calculated my money and how much relatives I had. I figured I was like, if I go to the first holy thingy, who knows? So, well, it worked out. <laughs> I did it with cross fingers. I, I, I do it for Galileo, so I could afford this telescope. Um, after that, I became like in, in, in the 90s, like a serious junior scientist. I was working with the Max Planck Institute in Heidelberg. I did like this astronomic, was like astronomy was everything. And my parents hoped that one day I'm, I'm becoming like a Nobel Prize winner or something. But then I had this one moment in the 90s when Halley's Comet was coming by the Earth. And people came in the observatory almost every evening and they said, they said we want to see with your large, huge telescope, the comet, where is it? And you could barely see anything. It was just like not interesting at all. It was like small and tiny, and mostly you couldn't see. But then the friend said, it's like, okay, listen, we do it that way. If people come in and they want to see Halley's Comet, and there's nothing to see, you do it that way. You take the telescope, put it on a large star, go to the eyepiece and make a bit. <laughs> Everybody will have a nice evening. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we did. It looked pretty much like that. One blurry dot. It worked. I mean, the telescope was going like like five telescopes in five different directions, but everybody had Halley's Comet. <laughs> and I think on that point, I decided not to become a Nobel Prize winner instead of like that, studying art and design. Okay, and similar explanation happening for me, really. Um, of my parents' whole bookshelf of works by George Orwell, serious scientists, astronomy, mathematicians, you know, all serious stuff. The one book that I really obsessed about as a child was this one. It's called The Art of Tabletop Photography, and it is a kind of um, early example of designers and Photographers using little model sets to make optical illusions, the sort of things that still go on in filmmaking today. And more recently, when I was uh, working up in Edinburgh, on a residency up in Edinburgh, um, I discovered, I was looking into the history of the Scottish Enlightenment, and I discovered a couple of characters called James Naismith and James Carpenter, who basically hung out in Leith on Carlton Hill. Most of their Enlightenment, I think, was spent in the pubs at Leith. And um, they lacked the telescopic power available to Hagen. So what they did is they looked through their telescopes at the moon and they said, well, kind of the detail's not quite enough. The resolution's not enough. So they made little models, plaster cast models, um, of what they thought they were seeing on the moon and then they re-photographed those. And you'll notice the word, an ideal sketch of Pico, an isolated lunar mountain, blah, blah, blah. So I really kind of related immediately um, as an illustrator and a model maker to Naismith and Carpenter. And the residency I was on was um, at Edinburgh Printmakers, so my response to their work 
was to um, look at the moon myself and imagine in a bit of a kind of Peter Ferdinand of a postgate Kleiner kind of direction what the surface of the moon might look like. So these are actually very traditional copper plate etchings that I'm working on still and um, they are how I imagine the surface of the moon. So they are as real as my imagination. All right, so this is, yeah. so we're still talking about like our individual practices at the moment. Um, after I studied, so after I had this epiphany with like Helmut Conner, I studied art and design. And in, in the last five minutes of being a student, I, I really asked myself is, uh, what, what I'm interested actually in and what is what I want to do. And I, I came up with this diagram, which still works for me after 10 years quite well. Um, I made this sophisticated illustration of it's like, okay, do, I'm a designer, uh, I do art, and sometimes I work with science, I do fiction, but the thing I have really the most knowledge of is general theory, which is in the middle of here. Uh, <laughs> it's the most interesting area of them all. If you go, for example, up to design, it just is gray. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, it's really interesting, it's like, channel theory, that's, that's what I'm doing. And since 2001, I'm running a little institute called the Institute for General Theory, or German Institute for Allgemeine Theorie, which is wonderfully described by the works from Scholop de Scholli. The Institute of General Theory is a project of indetermination duration for anything from one to the infinity number of participants. It operates in an undefined area in the gray zone where there is no distinction between fiction and science, art and craft, independent work, sense explanation, between game, experiment and paid work, between experimental and studio space, or between museum and university. I'd like to interject here. We were talking earlier in the break that we think that possibly there are only five German artists working today. Two of them are at least in the room, the other three maybe are dead. Um, I'm beginning to be suspicious of the fact that this isolation of artists in Germany means that they all need their own institute. <laughs> so that is my, this is my institute. Most of the institute is like operating uh, globally and worldwide. And sometimes the institute appears, like for example here in a, in a complex installation at the museum. Um, and there's like this kind of wunderkammer assembly of like instruments, research instruments, antennas, blackboards, and so on. Just to give you an idea. But I'm not talking about the institute tonight because then we will sit here the next couple of hours. So we continue with Sue's work. Okay, so we're getting a bit closer to why, um, I, I hope in your minds at least, you're beginning to understand perhaps the um, collaboration that's forming here. Um, this is a project from last year. It's called One Day a Spaceman. And I mentioned Joel earlier. Uh, my friend Joel wrote this story when he was seven years old. And um, I maybe should read you a very short extract from the story. Highly uh, literal. Um, and what I did as a printmaker was I made a verbatim copy of it and still screened it. It's now in the National Poetry Collection, by the way. You can go down to the South Bank and request it. Um, okay, one day a man went up to the moon and he saw a monster and the monster came to get him and he fell over and the monster picks the man up and the monster threw the man out into space and the man went to another planet. And this is what he saw, a monster, a werewolf, a dragon and a lot more monsters. He had to go away. He could not go away. He had to get back to his spaceship. The end. <laughs> A spaceship, and he fell off the planet, and he found his spaceship. One day a spaceman went up to the moon, and this is what he saw, a monster. And a dragon, and he had to get away. He fell off the moon as he was floating along, he saw lots of monsters, and then he came to a planet. Are you getting the theme? And he saw his spaceship, and he left the moon, and he never went up to the moon again. On the next day, the spaceman said to another spaceman, I am leaving this job. <laughs> Um, this is a research called Promesos Recurrence, which I did with the Institute of General Theories two years ago. It's an experiment my grandpa showed me. It's a very simple thing. It's a, Rob, is your son gone? Because I think it's, you shouldn't hear it, it's dangerous. It's 
stuff like this could happen. Okay, good. Uh, my grandpa showed me how to make fire with like a magnifying glass. I guess we all did it in the garden, and poor, the poor ants are just like. Well, it's, it's a simple thing. It's like if you take a magnifying glass and you hold it in the sun, you get like fire instantly. And if you think about the sun as a star, as the question was my question is, if the magnifying glass is big enough, can you make fire with one star? Because it, I thought it's like, okay, it's like maybe if we take a telescope and the telescope is big enough, and instead of the sun, we take maybe Sirius, which is eight light years away, then we can burn, oh, fortunately it's in this corner here. Yeah. We can make star fire. So what I did, is at this time, I, I did a residency in Weimar, and I worked together with Studio Bauhaus and State Observatory, and the guys from Studio Bauhaus were running a small TV station, and they said, it's like, wow, this is really interesting. We could weave this in into like a TV show that we're planning, and maybe we can do this, or we can work on that. So I called the State Observatory and asked if somebody would be interested in, in doing this experiment, and luckily I found an astrophysicist, Dr. Gunther Wuchta, who said, it's like, wow, this is a really interesting idea to make fire with like, one star through a telescope. I quickly calculated this with my Casio, and he was going. <laughs> that is like, yeah, it's interesting. Then they made a TV show, so that's me and him in the TV show. And Dr. Wuchta is uh, calculating how big the telescope must be to like directly fire with one star. And he said, yeah, it would be possible if the telescope would be around 100 kilometers in diameter, it would work. Unfortunately, the biggest we have is like eight times eight meters in the Akatagama Desert somewhere in Peru. But he said, it's like, hey, I have another idea. I'm, I'm the leading expert in light pollution. What we could try is we take the telescope and put on the telescope a solar panel. And with the solar panel, we measure the energy that is coming down from one star and charge a battery. So that's a good idea. Let's do that. <laughs> And then the idea was to use the battery to make one spark to, to light liquid hydrogen. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it with hydrogen, and we did it with propane gas. So what we did is we drove out to the state observatory one night, used the telescope, measured how much energy is coming down, charged the battery. This is during the TV show, and other scientists are really suspicious about that. <laughs> And I, I have to admit, at this point, uh, the battery is charged with star energy from Sirius, but it's only like a homeopathic pot. <laughs> to charge the whole battery would take 65,000 years. But then it would be pure star energy, I mean, it's possible. If you would do it with the large telescope in the upper camera, it could go under 12 years. But unfortunately, you don't want to give us the telescope for 12 years. So what happened at the end of the show is, we used the energy to lit a small propane cooker and had star fire, and then the scariest thing happened. Outside the studio, they lined, people were lined up with candles and, and, and lanterns, and they were kind of like, can we get a copy of the star fire? And we both stand there and have like, like, yeah, of course. And they suddenly get this religious moment where we gave like, the star fire to the views of the star series. I think this is kind of karma for what happened several years before. <laughs> Oh, okay, so um, we're kind of getting closer to the present now. So this is a project that I'm working on currently. I'm working down at the National Archives at Kew with uh, some Ministry of Defence records, uh, which are UFO sightings. And unbelievably, the Ministry of Defence actually really has a department that deal with sightings of UFOs. And there are official forms for the recording of observations. And these drawings are actually being made by members of the public on things that they have seen. My particular favourite is the one with the alien and the spacecraft. That's unfortunately it's in the corner. Okay, maybe you can slide it across. Okay. Well, really helpfully, just in case there's any confusion, the member of the public has indicated that this is a sketch of a person, and that this over here is the sketch of the spaceship. So I'm... I'm 
collecting these drawings and I'm making a book. Um, um, this is the bit that I've done so far, and then what I'm doing now is beginning to work with the texts where there is no illustration, so there is no interpretation, and I'm providing that service rather retrospectively. Um, and my current favourite description is of um, a giant black teddy bear floating in space. Um, so you'll have to kind of watch this space and see how that turns out. But I hope that book's going to be published by End Book Group Makers next year. Oh, done? Okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> a smooth tea. Yeah. Okay, um, oh yeah, is this me again? Yes, you. Yeah, um, and we're almost back to Norway, but we both have a rock to talk about, and it's real interesting that Agnes was talking about moon rocks earlier, because this particular rock um, is in the collection of the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, and it was given, presented to the then Prime Minister in 1969, Mr. Dries, by um, uh, Buzz and Neil in 1969, uh, and... Okay, in 2009, they decided maybe they would test it. Only it's not a moon rock, it's a bit of fossilised tree. Um, so the Wright Museum, rather gamely, after having exhibited their moon rock for many years, you know, and uh, having seen Agnes's samples, it's quite clear why this is probably could never have been a real moon rock, the size of it, um, decided gamely to keep it and exhibit it as a historical curiosity. So I'm um, having permission to go next month to the Rijks Museum to make some drawings of it. And uh, that's my rock. So, my rock is, is really interesting that Agnes, you were talking about your rock. So we, we have to talk later, so it's really it's very interesting. Since 2008, I'm involved in kind of a PhD. I'm, I, I think I'm doing a PhD, I don't know exactly. Um, <laughs> I'm like 18 person, two semesters in I'm 18 person down with my PhD about a new, new media whatever that is. It's definitely newer than new media. It has nothing to do with new media. And for, for that experiment, I want to drop in 2012, which we all know is Armageddon. And if not, we would be all disappointed. I, I want to drop a giant boulder from the highest possible position. Yeah, easy. It's, so we have definitely to talk to you, the expert. And the reason is, I have a different reason why I want to do this, is just to harvest as much as possible aspects of this approach to artistic research. And why? To get fined into the state of post-artistic research. <laughs> and if I look on my roadmap, bang. Bang. Meanwhile. <laughs> no, no, maybe this pylon looks slightly different now. Maybe perhaps you're able to get quite why two very different people from very different backgrounds decided to form a collaboration. So this is like the first thing we did after uh, this epiphany moment at the pylon. We started like playing around with our sketching skills and our fantasy was collided and came together. Um, you, you talk about oh, that. Okay. All right, so this is our first project together, and um, Hagen was claiming for many years that he'd made, wanted to make a print edition. I said, well, that's curious, I'm a printer, let's give it a go. Um, and we were talking a long time about Norway, about the pylons, about A, humans, B, construction, and C, surprise. Uh, the surprise in this case being the presence of rabbits on the moon. Although, apparently, in um, the east of the world, they see a rabbit on the moon and not a man on the moon, so maybe not such a surprise. And also, I was thinking very much in terms of colonisation of the rabbits that the Brits hopefully took to Australia um, and then infested the place. So the second print shows um, a silver Victorian pepper pot rocket, which is I think, really coming from my imagination in H.G. Wells. And one poor little rabbit still sitting there slightly confused while Hagen's builder Veritas litters the landscape. Uh, you can't see the shopping list here, but there's a shopping list left by the builders which includes toilet roll, over a collider, coffee, helium three, things to knit to the shops for. Um, this print was called Back in Five Minutes. Should I zoom in? Yeah. Pizza. Pizza. Spark plugs. Very important thing, air freshener. So in, in this scene, uh, the builders have nipped off and left the Zenit station. And anybody who deals with BT broadband in this country um, 
probably familiar with what happens next once the builders move out is the sign of him Royal Bell can you see? And, and it's, it's complicated because I have to operate with both hands that oh, like, hang on, no, I can no, help um, yeah, thank you uh, and to make it more complicated we, we, I said a sake, a sake, okay, we do printmaking I agree to that, but I want to do like it's like the most interesting stuff I ever wanted to work with uh, get this really, really like uh, from Mark okay. at Sellafield. <laughs> well, so the, the prints have an on-off function, and they operate in the light, and they operate in the dark, and they tell a slightly different story in the dark. On that point, I want to remind you, I'm definitely not a printmaker, as you can see here. It's like uh, actually, it's like I think it's the first time in my life that I get ink on my fingers. <laughs> he moaned a lot. In fact, I think you claim that in your country, monoprinting is strictly illegal. Yeah, it is illegal. <laughs> <laughs> I never do it again. <laughs> hey, anyway, um, after subjecting Hagen to um, the terrors of a print workshop, um, in 2009 we had the opportunity and the invitation to go to Malmo to make an installation called Lost in Space. Now, originally, um, it was going to be quite a small event. I was going to make quite a small installation with an OHP, and very much based on the work that I was doing in Norway. Um, when uh, Hagen and I started to collaborate, the project kind of grew. These are um, star maps of actual constellations. They've been laser cut into these sheets of card at Falmouth University. And we still wanted to hang on, though, to the kind of Oliver Postgate, Peter Furman inventor's shed. So the technology that we decided to work with to make our own universe in a box was still the blessed old overhead projector and a sheet of cardboard. Uh, and something came up in Germany, didn't it, about a week before you were due to fly out and meet me and make the project? Yeah, yeah, I was really lucky that I could do it there. And I had, uh, this is one of the first installations at ACC Gallery in Weimar that we used it. Low tech technology, OHP, star maps. And... Okay, uh, I mean, definitely no talk about space without the picture of the famous picture of Camille Flammarion, how we imagine outer space. It's a famous one. It's space, uh, an unknown place, far away, completely unimaginable. I mean, nowadays, we can imagine space, we know a lot about space, but one thing we completely forgot for a long time in terms of space is the question which I carry around since ages. It's very simple, it's how the universe smells. <laughs> One of my sketches. This is, this is all we guessed a couple of years ago, how the universe could smell, but actually no clue. And I made one day, I made this drawing, what this idea was, it's really simple. Uh, if you look on this diagram, it's like, this is distance, this is knowledge. As far away we go from Earth, knowledge goes down, really. what's going on here. And if you look on the solar system, for example, you have the highest resolution on smells on Earth, then on the Moon it gets a bit low rest, <laughs> then on Mars maybe we can get a sample, but then the samples get smaller and smaller, and there's the break point, and on Jupiter we just could get like a gas from it, on a uh, Saturn and so on, we have no idea. So what we could do is, if we have like spectral analysis for these, we could create kind of a global smell out of these. So let's start with the moon. Okay, what does the moon smell like? Is that written on the roadmap? No, that's my question. Oh, okay. Good. I, I don't know. But, <laughs> but what we know is that in 69, when we've been on the moon the first time, uh, we collected a lot of rocks, which are stored now in, in uh, safes. <laughs> and the guys got really dirty pants. And the first person who ever actually talked about the, the smell of the moon were their power, power smells, but nobody actually paid attention to what is said is that. And the first one actually is Charlie Duke and Alan Bean, when they got asked, I had the chance to ask a friend, and she asked Alan Bean, what does it smell like when you came back? And he said, ugh, nasty, like rotten eggs inside a space landing module. Because most people say, how can the moon smell? Because you can't smell it, there is no atmosphere. How, how should it work? But then what they did is they reported actually when the space suits with the dust 
get into like the atmosphere of the lunar lander, and then they could smell it. Yeah, and there's a couple of theories really about what's going on. Um, one is that it's somehow the smell is linked to the uh, mineral constituent of the moon rocks, but actually analysis shows this really doesn't work out. Um, because so much of it is a kind of glass now. Um, and even on Earth, really, there's no smell. The smell disappears very quickly. So the, the current theory is that what's generating the smell is the loose molecules that have never been in contact with oxygen or moisture before starting to literally burn up in, in an atmosphere. And this is the kind of same kind of reaction as basically when you light a match. So this smell of gunpowder, burnt steak, is what the astronauts are actually experiencing when the dust that's on their suits is first coming into contact with an atmosphere. Should I go on? Oh, yeah. OK. So what we did was we contacted a guy um, who's an industrial chemist down in Ipswich, a guy called uh, Steve Pierce, and a company called Amiga Ingredients. Um, Amiga Ingredients um, work with industry, but they also do research projects. And they had been approached by NASA several years previously um, when NASA were looking for somebody to work with to recreate the smell of space for astronaut training. I'm not quite sure how this is helping, but that was the idea. <laughs> Anyhow, um, they obviously decided they had a better use for a few million pounds and the project got dropped. But um, Steve Pierce, when I rang him up and said, you know, how about giving us the smell of the moon instead, said, okay. So uh, we worked with Steve to synthesize the smell based on the data that he had been given by NASA and the reports of astronauts, including Charlie Duke, who he interviewed. And then we worked with another company called Aromaco, who turned this uh, synthesized smell into uh, a printable ink, which we printed our first moon scratch and sniff card <laughs> off at Edinburgh Printmakers last year. And I have to say, it, it, it is a really interesting, um, nasty smell. Not, not altogether repulsive, and um, these prints are going to be exhibited at Edinburgh International Science Festival this year, and possibly also in New York later this year. So we're originally a commission for the Stadium Museum. Two minutes. Yeah, very quick. Uh, because we can't all scratch and sniff on the card now, we prepared something. It's like the last drop we have from the moon smell. It literally is the last drop, so we're not actually sure if it's going to work. You might all have to individually but smell the card if it doesn't. So we really would like to share the tonight. <laughs> <laughs> we give it a go. Oh. Are you operating the machine? Yeah, I, I operate the machine. Note the tripod. Yeah. Okay, hold your breath. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you're doing that, maybe not. <laughs> Anybody smelling yeah. anything? Yeah. 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 Kind of pungent, smoky. Yeah. If, if, you, if you're getting it great, if you're not, come and smell the card later. Um, and finally, finally, finally. Um, some astronomers working at the IRAM um, telescope in Spain were recently looking at Sagittarius B, and I think this has been quite widely reported in the press. Um, they were looking for amino acids, the building blocks of life. They didn't find any, but they found a product called ethyl formate, which is one of the key constituent ingredients in the smell of both raspberries and rum. So their conclusion is that the universe as a whole is smelling of raspberries and rum. So we've uh, commissioned two samples from Aromaco, which arrived, arrived in the post this morning. So if we can, we're now live. Adults Catalyst are going to try and recreate the smell of the universe.
to. Um, any quick questions before we go into drinks? Anyone? What? Yeah. Somebody have one? Yeah. What toilet freshener do you use? Fresh It's like yeah. Summer, spring, spring. Spring, spring. Mass spring. Mass spring. Mass spring. Mass spring. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just to say, um, we will be, we'll be open until 10 o'clock. We'd like you all to um, go then. Um, but um, you're welcome to stay and drink um, for a little bit. Um, and after that, um, the suggested pub is The Crown in uh, Clarkenwell Green. And some of us will also be going to Cafe Saffron, which is um, an Indian restaurant almost opposite it. So The Crown in Clarkenwell Green. But we're not kicking you up just yet. So um, please enjoy more drinks and discussions. And thank you very much. Now, do you want to say anything? Well, no, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, we have till ten. There will be a couple of uh, more slots for for going into space. And yeah, oh, yeah. so I forgot to say thank you very much for Tin Fingers who are taking people into space in our little room there. Um, <laughs> so if you haven't yet been into space, now is your chance. Okay, so don't forget, Yuri's night. April the 12th. See you there. Goodbye.